Okay. It is almost never that I say this to you, but I actually suggest that you watch this video completely through because um, I'll actually tell you something that you're not going to get from any book on photography, you're not going to get it from anybody working at any camera store, and you're not going to get it from any workshop on photography from anybody when it comes to lenses. And let's try to make this really, really simple. Sometimes I'm uh, verbose. And I'm going to make this extremely pithy so people understand. I uh, yesterday made a video, and you know there's a pile of images out there. You don't actually have to uh, have a car in your hand to know that if you can take a look at the design of a car, if you know enough about cars, you can say, yeah, this, this car is going to have an issue. Well, all the images popped up on that 105 millimeter uh, f1.4 Nikkor, which has 14 elements in it, and the images are just horrific. Uh, other people, there's some people that actually, a lot of people actually saw it, and I posted the links to that. Some people were looking, but they didn't actually know what the hell they were looking for. As I mentioned yesterday, it's kind of like inviting, and this is no offense, but I mean, it's kind of like a, inviting a wino in to try out some select wines from Italy and France. You know, he to, he, he, he's not going to make out the nuances of, of uh, fi yeah, it's, it's all crushed and fermented grapes, right? Okay, so it's all the same stuff. Well, if that's the case, then why don't you just buy some of the junkiest crud out there? I've never been one to advocate expensive lenses. I've said from the get-go, like, for example, the 70-200 2.8 Nikkor is a horrible, stinky lens. And uh, I knew Nikon had to be working on a replacement for that lens because it stunk, because this lens is so much better. And recently it was proven right. It turns out that they are working very hard on it. And apparently they're done with it. And it's going to come out uh, sometime in the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Well, let's talk about the secrets of lenses that you're never going to learn. And let's talk about what you don't understand. Okay? And nobody else understands this. Well, actually some hardcore lens designers in Japan. And some really hardcore uptight people, I'm half German, I can say this, uptight people in Germany <laughs> understand this fact, and that is all lens design is a trade-off. You know, it's kind of like uh, how you could build a car, like a Humvee, it could be super, super thick and plated with armor, and yet it is not that slow, not, not that fast, and not that agile. You know, if you uh, quadruple the weight of a car, it is generally not too good at making corners. And uh, if I have a lens like this that is universally useful, and this is the professional bread and butter, the 70 to 200 2.8, this lens has a lot of elements in it. This lens has faster autofocus tracking. We're not talking about autofocus tracking. We're talking about the nature of lenses. Now, if I shoot a handgun through a piece of wood about yay thick, and it passes through there, and then I stick another piece of wood behind that, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. you know, I'm trying to hit a target. And, uh, you know, one lens has got six pieces of wood between the gun and the target, and the other one has 23 pieces. What do you... Did do, do you know the light is actually an electrical circuit, right? You, you, you do know that, right? Light is an electrical circuit? Um, <laughs> light has capacitance, okay? Uh, you know, that's kind of why uh, blue end spectrum light is damaging. You know where chromatic aberration comes from? Okay, that's where light actually arrives in a different place at the same time, or another issue, it arrives at a different time in the same place. I want to make this really simple so you understand the secrets of good lenses versus bad lenses, and why everything is a trade-off, and why, for example, well, I have right here a 70 to 200 millimeter, and right here, oh, I have a totally different lens. This lens is so awesome, it'll make you scream and want to slap your mother. It's the 180 millimeter f2.8. Another great lens is the 105 F2 DC Nikkor. Um, I've uh, been mentioning some of the super, super awesome yet very cheap lenses. This lens is not that cheap. It's $1,000 new, but you can find these all day long for $300 used. Nikon still makes this lens for a reason, because hardcore professionals shoot this lens, because it has the pop, the wow factor, the color saturation, the micro contrast that when you take a picture with this lens as opposed to this, you go, yes because that is the difference. It's like, why would I ever, well, primes are better. You know, you hear this, you hear this crap all day. Well, which is better, a prime or a, well, a prime is better. Okay, well, that's fine, schmuck. Why don't you tell me why the hell a prime is better? Well, because a prime is better. Wait a minute, you just got done repeating yourself. 
You know, what the hell are you, a damn parrot? No, I said Prime is better. You know, everybody kind of knows. Okay, well, let's agree on that fact. Now, you tell me why the hell a Prime is better. Here is a reason why that new lens, and this is not about that new lens. It is one example. That lens is a Prime lens, which, while it's incredibly fast at f1.4, most people are not too interested in portraiture, by the way. We have a depth of field like this. It's like, well, her, eye, her ear is out of focus, but part of her eyes in focus. Well, isn't that wonderful? I think Nikon only made that lens to brag that they've got the fastest uh, 105 portrait lens out there. That lens, the images from the... People say, well, you don't have that lens in your hands. It's like, what the hell more do you want? I've already seen a pile of images from that lens of people that have it. The images suck. I'm talking, they gave that lens first to professionals. Some people say, well, maybe it's just the raw processing. No, they gave this lens to some professionals that know how the hell to process raw files. So I know that, isn't it? These people have been prof uh, processing. <sighs> they took a lens that is a prime lens, but they gave it the negative, this is what you're not understanding. They gave it the negative characteristics of a zoom lens. Okay, you see, a prime, this is what you do not understand, and, I, and I'm not like taking an ego trip on you here. Just open your ears up, okay, because you're not going to learn this anywhere else. The nature of an awesome prime lens is its simplicity and divinity. Now, I own some hardcore expensives. I got a pile of Zeiss lenses in the back room. Some of them are insanely expensive. Um... Anybody that shot that lens, any of those lenses, most of them will tell you, oh, wow, man, those lenses have some serious chromatic aberration with high contrast. So you're shooting a white flower in a green field. You shoot wide open, man, you'll see some purple fringing on that. Every lens design is a trade-off. What Nikon did is they made the mistake, and usually you're supposed to say, well, cust uh, businesses are supposed to listen to their customers. No, sometimes the business, especially people have been designing lenses for decades, no more than the customer. They took what should have been a divinely simple lens. They could have made it super fast with a low element count. That lens has 14 elements in it, okay? This lens has eight elements in it. This lens is divinely simple. Now, we're not talking about wide angles. We'll talk about that in a minute. Everything below 35 millimeters in focal length is a toss-up, and I'll tell you why in a second. The secrets of lens design is that you have a compromise. You could either have a lens like this that is universally useful for wedding. I can zoom in or out from 70 to 200. And I got a nice wide, uh, fast lens. Uh, this should be nice to the fast lens at uh, f2.8. Okay, that's great. This lens, and nor any other zoom lens, is a replacement for a good prime equivalent. And people think, well, what's the difference? What's the difference? Well, prime is better. Why don't you tell me why the Halo Prime is better? All lenses are reducible to, other than construction, of course, the quality of construction, are reducible to a few criteria. Resolution, which everybody chirps about endlessly. Phase, gain, and bandwidth. Bandwidth, color saturation. Uh, like this lens uh, soaks up a blue light. If you take a picture of something blue, it looks more washed out because it's got 23. We have 23 pieces of wood in this lens that your bullet, i.e. the light, is passing through. Okay, isn't that wonderful? This lens is uniquely, universally useful because it is between a 70 to 200. Okay, great. Fashion photographers in general, however, that's kind of changing. The people that actually know what the hell they're doing, I've met a lot of hardcore professional shooters, people that are like world, world famous, and they've only ever used like a dozen lenses. Even they don't know this stuff. I mean, I know this for a fact. I've talked to them. But what they do got, they use really, 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 really well. Uh, there are better options that they have not tried yet. Most, basically 100% of the people out there are not going to try, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lenses. And they're not going to sit there and think about the differences and what defines one versus another one. This, the simple nature is that you need to understand that all lens design is a trade-off. Okay? That lens, for example... The 105 f1.4 has too many glass elements in it. It renders horribly. The bandwidth is horrible. Okay, what they did by adding all what they have and all those extra glass elements that are in there, and I think actually one of them is a plastic element. I haven't confirmed that yet. Is that they've eliminated out all the chromatic aberration. So at f1.4 you could almost shoot into the sun and get no chromatic aberration. Well, isn't that special? Another thing they've done is they've improved corner-to-corner -corner sharpness so that at f1.4, you can still get good corner-to-corner. -corner. Well, isn't that special? 
what they've done in letting that lens have those attributes is that they've sacrificed these superior attributes that make up a real prime lens. If Nikon wants to make that lens that way, fine, let them make them that way. Other, you know, it's kind of the amazing the responses that I got from people when I showed them those pictures. So, you know, so everybody was looking at the same images, but they couldn't actually see. They're kind of like a person that's been trapped in prison for 40 years, and, you know, the best thing that they've had in 40 years is like the meatloaf that comes once a month. They've never had a really good meal or a good steak. I mean, all these people that say, well, that image looks good. And, you know, I want to say to them, it's like, listen, no offense, but I'm sure you think that image does look good. But I'm talking about compared to what? What about compared to something that is not only a whole lot cheaper, but the hell with price, okay? The hell with price. Not only is it a whole lot cheaper, but it is far, 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 far better. This is just one example among many. Now, people have brought up the seeming yet incorrect contradiction that lenses below, they said, well, you praise the Fuji 16 millimeter, you praise this fisheye lens, or you, you praise the 20 millimeter Nikkor, which has quite a few elements. Yes, I have. There is a focal point, it basically is below 35 millimeters, so you're basically talking 24 millimeters and below. Okay, these are the focal lengths at which it is necessitated to get a decent, pretty damn good image. Um, and you're not talking about portraiture image where it just pops right off out at you. Um, that they have to have uh, quite a few aspherical and ED elements, so the lenses end up being 8, 10, 12, 14 element lenses. It is the breaking point at which we are not discussing you know, ultra simplex divinity lenses that have four, five, six, seven, eight elements in them. So the breaking point is 24 millimeters and below. So when we talk about that criteria, we're talking about little people versus tall people. It's like we're in a different room now. You want to talk about something that's 24 millimeters and below? We're talking about a totally different class of lenses. So yes, those lenses do have a lot of elements in them. That is an absolute necessity of design. What is not a necessity of design is when Nikon and other people who are basically almost imitating Sigma, which is absolutely disgusting, um, make these lenses that have as little, and customers are asking for this. Like, well, that's, that lens is expensive. It shouldn't have any chromatic aberration. And I just want to shake those people and go, listen, you have no damn idea what the hell you're talking about. You know, the lenses that the true hardcore pros are praising and using and the lenses that will just make you scream like a schoolgirl, like the 105 F2 DC Nikkor, this lens, the 108mm F2.8 D series. This lens has been made a long time. The 50mm F1.4. Oh my God! How many other lenses are there? Uh, I mean, a lot. The Takina 100 millimeter. I mean, there's. That's not made by Nikon, of course. These very, very simple lenses. The 85 millimeter, not the G series, but these really, really simple lenses that where the image is popped right off the damn page. If you don't believe me, do a YouTube search on a YouTube video called uh, the Dissectable Circuit. Uh, uh, the Dissectable Capacitors by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they actually show you where the glass itself, not the cathode and the anode, actually stores the charge. It's not in the cathode and it's not in the anode. It's actually in the glass. You can zap up a hunk of glass with enough of a charge that it will kill you. Glass is a capacitor. Now, it is the case that basically 100% of photographers don't know jack crap about field theory. Now let me grab something over here, okay? Now these electrical insulators on the power lines, they used to be made out of glass. You find these in antique stores. But you see this where this kind of blew out right here? What happened is, this happened, this is where linesmen would actually have an issue. They'd have to go out and replace these because they'd explode. What happens is, is the power would go out for whatever reason, just like it goes out today, and they'd ha and when the charge was turned back on again to the power lines, they'd get a huge impulse, especially back in the day, where they didn't actually have regulator controls on, uh, they still use glass insulators today, they're just not clear. Well, some of them are clear, but most of them are not clear. They actually now add additives to the glass, so it's able to dissipate the capacitance. But old stuff like this was just pure glass, and it has a capacitance, and when this charge uh, uh, 
went through this again where the high voltage uh, wire was wrapped around this insulator, it blew it out. You could actually find articles where old linesmen would talk about the power going out, the power going back on, and the surge was too high. These suckers would sit on top of the telephone poles and go off like damn bombs. Boom! And then they'd have to turn the power off again and go up there and put new glass insulators on top of the power poles. Glass is a capacitor. You know, just like shooting a bullet hole through a, a bullet through a piece of wood. You add another piece of wood and another and another and another. That butchers the light. You could take the best steak, the best filet mignon, and if you stick it through a processor and stick it through another processor and another, it's going to come out tasting worse than a McDonald's burger. Everything in lens design is a trade-off. And when somebody like Nikon stupidly, ignorantly, you know, makes a what could be a divine prime lens and they decide well we're going to remove all the chromatic aberration we're going to make it uh, awesome and corner to corner sharpness well that's all desirable but to do that you have to add all these extra glass elements in it that ends up making the lens a turd all lens design is a trade-off every bit of it i can either have the supreme convenience of the 70 to 200 which is the workhorse of professional photography but there are, you know since it's digital, we could actually use sliders for color saturation. We could do all these little sliders in Lightroom. Well, isn't that special? There is a magic. And anybody that has owned, most of you, most of you have not owned awesome lenses like this. This is but one of many, many examples. I just have this out here as one example. People that actually pick this up and they use like, oh my God, yes. This is what I've not seen in my picture. For. Yes. So the people out there that don't see it, I know you don't see it. And the reason you don't see it is because you're like a prisoner that's been eating, you know, slot for 40 years. You know, you, you just, you've not really experienced stuff like this. And uh, if you think that it's insulting, it's not meant to be insulting. The point is, is that all lens design is a trade-off. These are the secret. You can't, there is no lens that is perfect across the board. And there certainly are no perfect zoom lenses. There are some that are really, really damn good and far better than others. Construction being aside, it's like, wow, this, this zoom lens is really damn good. And uh, those have actually gotten a lot better than they used to be a couple uh, decades ago. But the odd thing is, and it's not odd at all if you know what the hell is going on, is that some of the best lenses is like oh my god what lens took this it must be a new lens it's like no this is a 40 year old Leica lens or this is a this is a lens design from 60 years ago that's been reproduced by uh, Voigtlander simplicity is divinity all lens design is a trade-off and glass is evil glass is evil I knew that lens would suck dead bunny rabbits before I even saw the images when I saw the images it was even worse than I thought it would be if you understand these principles of lens design, then you will understand where the hell the trade-offs occur one way or the other because you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't. And that's especially true in lenses. You can't have the convenience of the 70 to 200 and have the awesome, just absolutely, just the tits, silk, sex, and sugar output of this awesome prime lens. Or another one just like it, of which I've named all of them, basically. I've made endless videos about the awesome, awesome prime lenses. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And if you understand that fact, then you'll understand more than 99.99% .99 of the photographers out there about lenses. Okay? Does that improve your photography? No, but that does give you an insight into things about lenses and about selecting the right lens. Okay? Thanks. Bye.